a little bit of Bob Marley, Garveyite, lyrical Garveyism, musical Garveyism, spiritual Garveyism. Good Garvey Day, peace and black power to all my brothers and sisters around the world. I want to give peace and blessings to my brothers and sisters right here, the American African community, the 50 states and territories. Shout out to Texas, Los Angeles, shout out to Little Rock, Milwaukee, shout out to Canada, shout out to the Africans in Mexico, DC, Brooklyn, Queens, Harlem, Staten Island, Bronx, Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, North Philly, South Philly, Southwest Philly, Mount Airy, Darby, Yaden, North Philly, Susquehanna Avenue Babies, Allegheny Avenue Babies, Lehigh Avenue Babies, Ridge Avenue Babies, Gerard Avenue Babies, all my Mead Elementary School Babies, my Bieber Junior High School, West Philly, Winfield Babies, I am here. I am here. Y'all can fight over who the best rapper in Philly is. We know who the king of the conscious community in Philly is. Y'all can argue over who the best rapper in Philly is. There's no debating who's the top conscious mind in Philadelphia. I own it. I'm sorry. I don't own it in Philadelphia. I own it in the world. I don't own it in Pennsylvania. I own it in the world. I don't own it in the United States. I own it on all seven continents. King Kong Consciousness. Often duplicated, often imitated, never duplicated. Good evening, brothers and sisters. We're going to talk about a very important topic tonight. Good evening, brothers and sisters. We're going to talk about a very important topic tonight. And that is the life and legacy of the greatest Pan-Africanist of all time. The greatest black organizer of all time the greatest black leader of the 20th century. I'm going to repeat that. I'm going to repeat that. The king of Pan-Africanism, the greatest revolutionary Pan-African nationalist of all time, the greatest black organizer of all time, the greatest black leader of the 19th century born under the sign of Leo, as was I. His name, His Excellency, the most honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. This is a very timely message because this second day of Kwanzaa, Kuji Chagalia, is dedicated to self-determination. The second day of Kwanzaa, Kuji Chagalia, is dedicated to self-determination. There is no leader ever who has exemplified, displayed, manifested, taught the principle of self-determination more than His Excellency, the Most Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. Brothers and sisters, let me be clear. Let me be clear. The seven principles of Kwanzaa, for those of you who don't know this, the seven principles of Kwanzaa, Umoja, unity, Kujichagalia, self-determination, Ujima, work and responsibility, Ujama, cooperative economics, Nia purpose, Kuumba creativity, and Imani faith. Kwanzaa was given to us by Dr. Milana Karenga, who I had the opportunity to meet for the first time in person at Cal State Long Beach when I keynoted the Black Consciousness Conference a few years ago. The largest attended Black Consciousness Conference in that university's history. Shout out to him. But I want to be clear. These seven principles of Kwanzaa, these seven principles of Kwanzaa are all taken from the philosophy and opinions 
of the most honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. When you look at the seven principles of quantum, you are looking at the foundation of Garveyism. That is Garveyism. We love Kwanzaa. We support Kwanzaa. Nothing's wrong with Kwanzaa. But let us be clear. The principles of Kwanzaa were extracted from the philosophy of Garveyism, which is the highest stage of revolutionary pan-African nationalism. Ever since I started raising funds for the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy, particularly since we purchased the school last year, seven days before the 201st birthday of the most honorable Frederick Douglass, who Marcus Garvey named the first black star line ship after, the SS Frederick Douglass. The first Marcus Garvey black star liner was named the SS Frederick Douglass. Marcus Garvey, the Honorable Marcus Garvey, never had a chance to meet Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass died February 20th of 1895. Marcus Garvey was eight years old in Jamaica. Frederick Douglass died February the 20th of 1895. Marcus Garvey was an eight-year-old boy in Jamaica. He didn't get a chance to meet Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey didn't get a chance to meet Frederick Douglass. Marcus Garvey being born on August the 17th of 1887 is very significant. Marcus Garvey being born August the 17th of 1887 is very significant because three years before Marcus Garvey's birth, the Berlin Conference took place. The Berlin Conference took place. What was the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885? What was the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885? The Berlin Conference of 1884-1885 is when the European powers of the world came together in Germany. The European nations of the world came together in Berlin, Germany, 1884-1885 to divide up the African continent amongst themselves. No African was present at the time that the European powers came together and decided that Africa would be theirs. Rumor has it, rumor has it that the European powers of the world actually rolled out a cake in the shape of Africa. Rumor has it that the European powers of the world actually rolled out a cake in the shape of Africa. And after they decided which territories would go to England, which territories would go to France, which territories would go to Belgium, which territories would go to Germany. Once they decided which territories would go to Portugal, which territories would go to Spain, once they decided which Europeans would steal which African territories. The Berlin Conference of 1884-1885 is when the Europeans officially split up Africa amongst themselves. Not a single African was there. Not a single African was there. Now, why did the European powers come together in the Berlin Conference? Because they wanted to avoid war amongst each other. They wanted to avoid war amongst each other. There's something you all need to understand. Most wars fought on the global scale. World War I, World War II. If you study the background conditions of World War I and World War II, you will know that those wars 
Just like the Cold War between America and Russia, just like the Cold War between America and China today, those wars are fought over who will control Africa and her resources. I will repeat myself. I will repeat myself. Both world wars and both cold wars, both world wars and both cold wars were fought over who would control Africa and her territories. So the Berlin Conference was a peace treaty amongst the Europeans where they sought to non-violently decide who would take control of what in Africa. The Berlin Conference is one of the most important events in the study of white supremacy. The Berlin Conference is one of the most significant events that must be studied in order for you to thoroughly understand white supremacy because it was from 1885 until today. It was from 1885 until today that the Europeans' control of the planet began with the subjugation and colonization of Africa and her resources. This is why we need the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy. This is why we need the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy. At the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy, Garveyism, the philosophy and opinions of the most honorable Marcus Garvey will be taught as a course, not a holiday, not an event, not a seminar. From kindergarten through 12th grade, your son and eventually daughter will master every tenet of the teachings of the highest stage of revolutionary pan-African nationalism, and that is Garveyism. That is this right here. And we have to thank Queen Mother Amy Jakes Garvey, the second wife of Marcus Garvey. We have to thank Queen Mother Amy Jakes Garvey, the second wife of Marcus Garvey, for this. Because had it not been for her, there would be no philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey. Had it not been for Queen Mother Amy Jakes Garvey, whose eldest son, Marcus Garvey Jr., joined the ancestors December the 8th. Whose oldest son, Marcus Garvey Jr., joined his mother and father in heaven December the 8th of this year. It was Queen Mother Amy Jakes Garvey who collected all of Mr. Garvey's speeches. It was his wife. See, that's a real black woman. While he was locked up in jail on phony charges of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, his wife, Queen Mother Amy Jakes Garvey, collected all the speeches and writings and interviews. Not all of them, but as many as she could collect, and she put them in this book. She put them in this book, The Philosophy and Opinions of Marcus Garvey. Had she not done that, most of you would have never known who this man was who inspired every other black nationalist organization that was created in this country after 1915. That's right. I don't care what organization you name, they copied Garvey, they borrowed Garvey, and in most cases, they did not give Garvey credit for what they took from him. I'm going to say it again. Every black organization that considers themselves nationalists borrowed Gav Garvey, they copied Garvey, and in most cases, they did not give Garvey credit for what they took from him. So Marcus Garvey is born right after the Berlin Conference. Some of you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was interviewed by a brother in New York who is a part of one of our legendary hip hop groups. And that brother from New York who interviewed me, a very negative, non-supportive, coonish type of an interview, but he asked me a question. He said, Marcus Garvey never went to Africa. And he said it as if he was exposing something. Marcus Garvey never went to Africa. Why didn't Marcus Garvey go to Africa? Now the question, which is absolutely ridiculous, totally exposed how much he doesn't know about African history, world history, or black nationalism, or revolutionary pan-African nationalism. Had he ever read a book on colonization, had he ever read a book 
on racism. Have he ever, had he ever read a book on the rape of Africa, he would know that the Berlin Conference took place in 1884, 1885. He would know that Marcus Garvey could not have possibly gone to Africa because the Europeans had totally taken over the African continent. The only two countries that were not colonized by the European was Liberia and Ethiopia. And Marcus Garvey tried to get into Liberia, but the United States State Department sent W.E.B. Du Bois. The United States State Department sent Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, the leading black scholar of the day, was sent to Liberia to destroy Marcus Garvey's plan to build a black Wall Street in Liberia for Africans in the diaspora who wanted to come back home. Du Bois was the Lex Luthor, Lex Luthor to Marcus Garvey the Superman. Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois was the Lex Luthor to Superman Marcus Garvey. It's always one of us that they get to take down one of us. W.E.B. Du Bois went to Africa, met with the president of Liberia, the government of Liberia at the request of the United States and begged them to severe all ties in communication with Marcus Garvey. W.E.B. Du Bois went to Africa. There were no airplanes then. He had to go by ship. There were no airplanes then. He had to go by ship. There were no airplanes then. He had to go by ship. And that jealous, that jealous, that jealous Negro went over there and destroyed an opportunity for Marcus Garvey to create a repatriation movement that the world had never seen. Now, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, he did apologize. After Marcus Garvey died, Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois did apologize. He did write a letter to Queen Mother Amy Jakes Garvey after her husband died, apologizing for the role he played in destroying the greatest black movement in modern history, the largest black movement ever, the greatest black organizer of all time. Yes, he apologized, but what good is an apology after the man is dead? What good is an apology after the man is dead? So at the age of 19, Marcus Garvey goes to Kingston, Jamaica in 1906. He begins working at a printing company. Marcus Garvey would become a master printer. This is important to understanding the success of the Garvey movement because in young Marcus Garvey becoming a master printer, everywhere he went, he was able to print a newspaper, propaganda information dissemination. Marcus Garvey understood that he had to protect his message. He had to educate the race. Marcus Garvey understood that if I do not print positive information about the African, if I do not motivate our people with the agenda of the Garvey movement, the American media will destroy my movement and destroy my message. To control your own narrative, you must print your own paper. To control your own narrative, you must print, create your own media. So Garvey built newspapers everywhere he went. This is critical because Garvey controlled his narrative. One of the messages we must learn from the example of the most honorable Marcus Garvey was that he understood the power of the printed word. Marcus Garvey understood the power of the printed word. And although he only wrote one book in his whole life, one book that is message to the people, the course of African philosophy, just one book, message to the people, course of African philosophy, although he only printed one book, he produced 
thousands of newspaper articles, thousands of magazine articles. Marcus Garvey was a master information propagandist, a master. A master. So, Marcus Garvey, mother dies. Queen Mother Garvey dies in 1908. Garvey is 21 years old. In 1910, he joins the National Club of Jamaica. This is important. This is important. In 1910, Garvey joins the National Club of Jamaica. This is where he would get his first tastes of Pan-African nationalism. This is where he would begin to develop those enormously powerful oratorical and communication skills. This is where Garvey would start debating and mastering the art of intellectual combat. His mentors at this time, Sandy Cox and Dr. Robert Love. I want to underline Dr. Robert Love for a minute. I want to underline Dr. Robert Love for a minute. I want to underline Dr. Robert Love. Y'all need to know this name. He was from the Bahamas. He was from the Bahamas. I had a chance to visit his home when I spoke at the University of the Bahamas with Jamaican Garveyite Muta Baruka. Shout out to Muta Baruka. We co-presented at the University of the Bahamas together. And I had a chance to visit the home of Robert E. Love. Why you need to know Robert Love? He was a friend of Frederick Douglass. He was a friend of Dr. Edward Wilmot Blyden. Robert E. Love, this Pan-Africanist in Jamaica, born in the Bahamas, would be critical for Marcus Garvey's intellectual and ideological development. It was Robert E. Love, more than anyone else on that island, with the exception of the other elders of the National Club, who really put into Garvey the Pan-Africanism that he would make so famous. This is important because there are some people of other organizations that have a Islamic persuasion who want to argue that it was Deuce Muhammad Ali that introduced Garvey to Pan-Africanism. You're wrong. Garvey doesn't meet Deuce Muhammad Ali until he's in England. Garvey doesn't meet Deuce Muhammad Ali until he is in England when he starts writing for Deuce Muhammad Ali's newspaper, The African Times in Orient Revent. Garvey was already a Pan-Africanist before he got to London to visit his sister. He was already a Pan-Africanist. Deuce Muhammad Ali did not introduce Garvey to Pan-Africanism. In fact, as a member of the National Club in Jamaica, and under the mentorship of Dr. Robert E. Love, Garvey was writing for the newspaper for the National Club known as Our Own. Our Own. Our Own is the essence of Pan-Africanism. Our Own is the essence of Kuji Chakalia self-determination. Garvey was already writing Pan-African articles before he left Jamaica. What are you Negroes talking about? Stop trying to take credit. It was Dr. Robert Love, not no Deuce Muhammad Ali, that gave Garvey his Pan-African nationalist foundation. So then Garvey starts traveling throughout Central America. He goes to Costa Rica, Panama. He goes all throughout the Central and South America. And Garvey said wherever he went, the most honorable Marcus Garvey said, wherever I went, I saw black people being mistreated, kicked about, treated like slaves, like animals. Marcus Garvey said, I looked up and I asked myself, Garvey said, I looked up and I asked myself, where is the black man's government? Where is the black man's king? Where is his queen? Where is his army? Where is his men of high affairs? And Garvey said he looked all around and he did not see it. So he decided. Garvey at that moment decided that I would help to make them 
Garvey said, this cannot be for my people. Garvey said, black people, African people, we do not belong on the bottom. We were not intended to be on the bottom. I will give my life to the resurrection of Africa and African people, those at home and those abroad. That's what Garvey decided. So he goes to London to visit his sister. He takes several courses at Birkbeck College. He did not earn a college degree, but he did study at the university level. Garvey returns to Jamaica, July the 8th, 1914. On his cruise back to Jamaica from England, now we're going to talk about this man behind me. Now we're going to talk about this man behind me. Now we're going to talk about this man on the wall behind me. On Garvey's way home, he read a book written by the founder of Tuskegee Institute by the name of Booker T. Washington. The name of the book was Up From Slavery. The name of the book that Garvey read on his way home to Jamaica from England was called up from slavery, Booker T. Washington. It was that book more than anybody else, more than anything else. Let me say it again. Let me say it again. It was that book written by that man, Up From Slavery, more than anything else or anybody else that motivated Marcus Garvey to build the largest black organization in modern history. On July the 20th, with the assistance of his first wife, then girlfriend, on July the 20th, with the assistance of his first wife, then girlfriend, Queen Mother Amy Ashwood Garvey, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League was birthed to the world. July the 20th, 1914, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League was launched in Jamaica. But there was a problem. There was a problem. And the problem was that Garvey wanted to build a mass racial organization to uplift Africans everywhere. This did not sit well with the black bourgeoisie of the Caribbean. Marcus Garvey's idea of a global movement for African people, whether they were light skin or dark skin, whether they were Muslim or Christian, whether they spoke Spanish or English, did not sit well with the black bourgeoisie of Jamaica. And therefore, the UNIA did not take off in Jamaica the way it would take off when Garvey got to the United States. Yes, it was Jamaica where Garveyism was born, but Garveyism did not grow into the strong tree that it would become until Garvey planted those seeds in New York City. It is important, brothers and sisters. It is important, brothers and sisters, to understand why Garveyism succeeded in America, but it did not succeed in Jamaica. Why did Garveyism succeed in America before it could succeed in the Caribbean islands? Because in America, white supremacy only has one group for black folks. You're black, whether you are super light, light bright, butter almond, pecan, pistachio, Fudge, chocolate, everybody's black in America. There might be certain privileges for the light skin. There might be certain disadvantages for the dark skin. But legally, there is only one category for African people in the United States. However, 
in the Caribbean islands, they had a very sophisticated